This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. And a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDV FM radio. Today's flowers are dedicated to the glory of God by Judy Perry in honor of Jordan's birthday and by Dolores Schaefer in loving memory of Bob. Our prayer requests this week are continued prayers for Sue S as she recovers from recent injuries and for Jean who is in the hospital. Each Sunday during Lent, we will sing Jesus Remember Me after our prayer of confession. This song is written to be sung repeatedly like a meditative prayer. So please join the choir in offering this musical supplication to the Lord. Our online community Lenten devotionals continue each Wednesday evening through March 24th. And our theme is the sounds of Lent where we reflect on familiar hymns of the season. The hymn this week will be, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And Reverend Ken Wonderland of Ben Salem Presbyterian Church will be our devotional leader. The video link to each week's devotional will be posted by 5 p.m. And you can access these devotionals on Wednesdays and anytime after that. And to to find the devotionals on our website at warmprez.org, go to the Ministries tab and click Sermons. Now, until Easter Sunday, we will be receive, receiving your annual One Great Hour of Sharing offering, which provides relief to those suffering from natural and human-caused disasters, to those lacking access to food, water, and health care, and to those struggling for justice, righteousness, and peace. You can make your donation online at warmprez.org or mail it to the church at 500 Madison Avenue in Warminster. Please indicate on your check or on your online devotion that your gift is designated for one great hour of sharing. Today, we will celebrate communion with Reverend Dr. Keith Lawrence presiding at the Lord's table, along with your fellow participants, Joan, Nancy, Walt, Al, Mark, Sharon, Carol, and myself. Please have something to eat and drink with you so we can partake together. And if you belong to another Christian tradition, please know that you are welcome to join us in celebrating this sacrament. Today's liturgists are Hannah, Shelley, and Sharon. And today's musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkus on organ and piano. And our hymn singers are Joan, Linda H., Sue G., Jonna, Jenny, Carol, and Cindy, conducted by our director of music, Dave Sathra. Our worship now begins with the sounding of the chimes. Children of God, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Worship continues with the morning prelude.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Friends, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination before we turn to scripture. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, 
the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. What, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the power wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord.
I'll be reading from John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. The Passover of the Jews was near, <clears throat> and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered this, that this was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking to, of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So often when we celebrate communion and we are praying for God's spirit to pour out grace upon the bread and the cup, we sometimes pray these words of petition. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And that prayer reminds us first that the Lord creates the church, not we. And second, that the church is created not simply to believe the gospel, but to embody it, to make it real in our own lives and in the life of the world. God's truth by necessity must be put into action. It has consequences. It must be lived out. That truth lies at the heart of scripture because it lies at the heart of who God is. It is God's nature to reveal and manifest himself through creation, through covenant, and ultimately through Jesus Christ. And the same goes for those on the receiving end of God's promises. Just as the word became flesh in Jesus Christ, so too must it become real and tangible through us. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ to the world. The covenant that God makes with Israel at Mount Sinai is all about that. As we heard Hannah read the Ten Commandments, we need to remember that the gift of the Ten Commandments is not just a list of do's and don'ts, but a way of life that embodies the nature of God and shows the world how life is to be lived in communion with God and with neighbor. In the words of Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann, the Ten Commandments is no mere set of rules, but the proclamation of who God is and how God shall be practiced by this community of liberated slaves. What Brueggemann means by that is that the Lord calls us and sets us apart to practice the nature of God. We are woven by the spirit into the community of Christ, not just to enjoy him for ourselves, but to reflect him to the world around us. And when those around us see how God's relationship with us changes everything for us, they'll know that they too can be changed. And that's why the Apostle Paul and his letter to the Corinthians chastises these Christians who live in Corinth 
because they think everything has changed, but from what he has heard about their behavior, very little has changed at all. Their faith calls them to reflect the unity of Christ, but instead they've become divided over various issues and opinions and practices. Their faith calls them to be humble and compassionate toward each other, but instead they've created a pecking order according to who they think have the stronger spiritual gifts. And they've made a hierarchy. They're competing for importance within the community. But Paul tells them that whatever truth their communal life is manifesting, it isn't the truth of the gospel. Their response to the gospel may be enthusiastic and passionate, but it still clings to the old life, where self-promotion rather than self-sacrifice is the order of the day, and where community is corrupted by competition. The truth they are embracing, Paul tells them, is just another version of the old life because the truth of the gospel and the way of life that reflects the image of God to the world looks nothing like what they are doing. And if anyone wants to know what it does look like, then look at the cross of Jesus. That's what the season of Lynn invites us to do, to look at the cross and to hold our gaze there. But even with the 40 days and five Sundays of Lent, even with Palm Sunday and all of Holy Week to ponder the cross, I don't think that's very much time, certainly not enough time for me. In fact, I don't think it's very helpful to look at the season of Lent as the only time to meditate on the cross because when we limit the meaning of the cross to just one time of year, we tend to see the cross as merely all the bad stuff we have to walk through before we can get to the joy of Easter Sunday, as though the cross is just one among many events in the ministry of Jesus, something that only happens on Good Friday. Now, of course, we know the crucifixion is only part of the good news, which is why anytime you walk into a Presbyterian sanctuary, the cross will always be empty. As Christians, we are to look to the resurrection as the source of our new life. But when we separate the resurrection from the cross, we open the door to making faith all about sunshine and flowers. But as Paul reminds us in his letter to the Corinthians, we may live in the power of the resurrection, but we are never to stop embodying the weakness of the cross. Because when we lose focus on the cross, we'll soon forget the way we are called to live. We risk confusing the kingdom of God with the kingdom of this world. Because this world is crazy about glory and power and triumph and victory. But the way the world defines glory and power and triumph and victory leaves very little room for humility self-sacrifice and the need for constant repentance. In fact, the world rejects those things as foolishness. So why then, why are we tempted to lose our focus on the cross? Why are we subconsciously afraid to embody it in the life of the church? In one of his sermons, the late Fred Craddock wrote that one of the reasons is that deep down, the church is afraid that the idea of a God who suffers and a Messiah who dies in weakness isn't what will draw the world to Jesus. 
Rather, we think the lure of comfort and strength is what we should reflect. Too much talk about the cross is not what will grow a church. Success is what attracts. When we think that way, we're not reflecting Jesus to the world. We are merely holding up a mirror and reflecting the world back to itself. Craddock also said this in his sermon. He said, faith is not a success story. Faith is a story that says, I take this up as a way of life. And I think you and I would do well to remember that after the resurrection, when the risen Christ sends his disciples out into the world, he raises his hands in blessing with the wounds of the crucifixion still on them. So when you and I are nurtured at the Lord's table and then sent out to be his body in the world, how will we take up his way of life? Let's ponder that question, not just during Lent, but every day we have been given to practice the nature of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Amen.
Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is a table of our Lord. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Holy God, when we were slaves in, in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On the holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of the Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new obedience in righteousness. You sent your Holy Son to be the way to eternal life. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Lord, who took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. You shared our life in every way. And though tempted, he was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made us a new covenant by water and the spirit. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this our offering of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and with all who are baptized in his name. Help us, O God, to be obedient to your call to love all of your children. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection. When with the redeemed of all ages, we will feast with you at the table in glory. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us boldly pray as our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life. Take and eat.
in the same way after supper he took the cup saying this is a cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins whenever you drink it do this in remembrance of me the cup of salvation drink of it all of you Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Let us pray. We now pray our prayer of thanksgiving for what you have given us in this sacrament. And pray that as we go out from here, we may serve you, may proclaim your, our risen Lord to all who would hear. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now rise up from the table of grace as our Lord sends us out to be his body in this world. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbors as yourself. Amen.